Hello, good evening, welcome to Our Front. My name is Raymond Aqua. This evening, my guest is a former Deputy Interior Minister. He's also currently the ranking member on the Defence and Interior Committee in Ghana's Parliament. Our conversation is pretty simple. A couple of days ago, two police officers were gunned down in a dastardly act by an individual or a team that's still being investigated. But one of the main directives of the Interior Minister is the one that's attracted a lot of flack and reaction from the public. This is clear. Arm all those who are members of the Motor Traffic and Transport um, Department of the Police. Basically, all traffic police will carry arms now. That particular directive is what's been kicked against by not only the chairperson of the National Peace Council, it's also been kicked against by members of that particular public safety grouping, Bureau of Public Safety. Latest to add the voice is distinguished professor of security and international relations, Professor Henrietta Mensa Bosu. We'll be putting all of those together and let you understand it better. But also, we'll be asking those who've been in that particular interior ministry if this is a terrible decision to make after the break this conversation will start you welcome back i did introduce him and my guest today is honorable james agaga and recently the people in his constituency decided to give him the nod to represent his uh, party again to contest in the next election. I hope you are doing well. I'm fine, Raymond. Uh, yes, how did the elections go? Oh, the elections went well. Um, uh, I won by a landslide. Oh, okay. Now, I'd like to um, say a big thank you to the Almighty and my team in supporters in the Bulls. Yes, you didn't go on a post. Yes, yes, yes. The you former had massive opposition. Yes, the for in the former member of parliament, the okay. one I unseated in mm. 2012. You were staging a comeback. Uh, for the third time around. Oh, I see. Yes, and um, this time around there was a new entrant, mm -hmm. um, a former journalist with TV3. Mm -hmm. uh, she joined the free, but, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, happily, I won by a landslide. I see. 81%, you know. How much did this spend in an election? It's an important question that all people who believe in disclosures and transparency have been answering and discussing. Well, I spent quite a fortune. Really? Because I, I had to spend money to, um, first of all, transport my supporters from one town to the other mm. in the course of the campaign. Um, apart from that, the filing fee alone was quite a lot of money, 27,000 Ghana cities. I see. It's a hoping sum of I, money. I, I get you, yes, it's huge. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that the party also used the season to raise funds for its, activi funds for its activities. Okay. So if that is anything to go by, I, in a way, we think that yes, political parties must uh, be able to raise money, but sometimes uh, but they need to take certain things into account. You've heard the claim that sometimes these elections go to the highest bidder, and that it has become more like monocracy. The democracy is basically becoming a money-oriented business. Well, I don't think so. I am a sitting member of parliament. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so there was evidence on the ground to oh, show okay. that uh, 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 there was need for continuity. Mm. And so. The evidence is the number of bills you helped promote or oppose in parliament, or it was some other non parliamentary work that got you elected. No, 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 no. Bills, yes, you can talk about bills. Yes. My, Which is uh, your primary my, duty my as a the, lawmaker. The, 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 uh, advocacy that I have uh, been able to engage in in Parliament and at the level of the constituency. So it was a combination of factors mm. that came to play. So at the level of the constituency, I had a lot of evidence to show, evidence of hard which, work. Which was what? And what the that people rewarded me handsomely for your that. Your advocacy in Parliament reflected in the hard work on the ground. How is no, that possible? No, 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 no. Yes. There are two levels here. Okay. Advocacy at the level of Parliament. Mm -hmm at the level of what, the plenary, mm -hmm. and at committee level. I think in a way, our people managed to make an assessment of my output Which at that level. specifically what? Now, uh, you made the point. Yes, I'm Your asking. Your active participation in the passage of bills. Yes, but how does that which go is to the do core with mandate of, on the ground? Which is the core mandate Mod of, yes, of, of parliament. parliament yeah. uh, aside that, 
you know, we have a fund, a developmental fund known mm. as the, the Common, Common Fund. Yes. I have been able to utilize it in a very judicious manner. And the evidence was clear for uh, my team in supporters to see. What did they see? And that's what I they want to saw declare, physical evidence on the ground. Projects I had lobbied for okay. as a certain member of parliament I in see. government and in opposition. I see. Projects that I was able to use my developmental fund mm. to initiate and to conclude. They saw these as pieces of evidence. We justified why they re-elected me for a third time. Which one is the, the party biggest to project you've done in the constituency? Oh, a lot. I lobbied for a lot of projects, including the construction of two huge dams. I lobbied for the construction is it of the dug out or the dam. dam. Proper dam. Proper dam irrigation for irrigation dam. purposes. Not dug out. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, what is it part the, of the, the irrigable land size is 100 one hectares. village one dam project no 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 and so when president mahama says mm -hmm. that we started with a policy to construct dams not dugouts mm -hmm. you find examples of those dams in the bulsa north constituency two of them two huge dams you can use them to irrigate 100 hectares of land in the dry season and there are two of their kind well, not see. not not the dugouts the ponds that have been constructed under this government, some I of see. which have already given way, uh, 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 you know, with the, out, the, 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 the rain, heavy rains, when the heavy rain set in, a number which, of them have already are you collapsed. Talking about? Which I'm talking about area? Bolga. It's not in your constituency. And, 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 and one of them also uh, uh, collapsed in the Kasina Nankana district. They are my neighbors, you know. Oh, I see. Yes. Mm. As for my area, just if a handful have so far been constructed and it's nothing to write to Before about. we deal with the substantive matter for today, there's a question though. Is Rosewood still a problem in your area too? Rosewood. Your adjoining constituency. It is a problem. Yeah, I, it, it, I, 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 I was uh, compelled to act on one occasion. Um, but mainly the problem uh, is more pronounced in the, the Bulsa South constituency, okay. where mm -hmm. my colleague is MP, Honorable mm -hmm. Park. Okay. But in the Bulsa North constituency, I had what, what, on one occasion I had to act. Do specifically. They felled what? the trees yeah. in um, a part of Weaga, which is in my constituency, mm -hmm. uh, illegally. So, with the help of the police, we moved in, we seized their equipment, we reported them to the police. And they had to take to their heels. Eventually, the Forestry Commission auctioned the um, trees that were unlawfully felled I mean, in accordance with okay. law. But that that then became a major disincentive. From that time onwards, I haven't had um, the experience of people moving into my constituency to carry out that unlawful activity. But my colleague, uh, um, Dr. Park, continues to grapple with that problem. It is a major problem Indeed, in the Indeed, today there was a press conference by the forestry uh, commission boss and he's of the opinion that there's a lot of exaggeration going on for us there's reference to some six million woods when he says the entire nation doesn't even have six no, million go to the northern he says part that, of the country yes he says that some of you are just we nobody's exploiting exaggerating the situation and exaggerating i think the, the forestry commission yes itself has not been fair to Ghanaians because they are the ones who issue out permits mm -hmm for um people logs to, fell that, yeah. to be salvaged mm -hmm. but you see when you do that people hide under the cover of salvaging to fail i see they go uh, fell cut the trees in the night and present the permits mm -hmm. and that okay they came across um the the, the you know rosewood trees felled unlawfully uh, but that they have permits for salvaging purposes so I, it I is difficult to draw the line Mm -hmm. And so Forestry Commission has not been helpful in this matter at all. Really? Okay, now let's move on to perhaps the main reason why we are gathered here today. It was that dastardly killing of two police officers, which is still being investigated and somebody's being put before court. Actually, the seven people are before court on that same matter. But on the night of that particular incident, the Interior Minister came out with a bold decision. This is to say, from now onwards, IGP, give the arms to every single traffic police officer. Let them openly display these arms to the people to see that they can fight back and protect themselves in the process. Immediately, the reaction has been that, no, no, this is 
too quick a decision to make, spare of the moment, and they didn't really think about it. The next group of people are saying that the police who are going to bear the arms, the traffic police, they need further training. Because you've seen how their colleagues have abused this in times past. Then the third group of people are saying, what you're even doing is virtually converting us into a police state. It doesn't assure anybody of the security levels in the country. It only scares more people. What, First what do you of think? All, Raymond, I, I, I am not too sure whether the directive the Minister for the Interior issued fell within the uh, um, scope of his um, authority as minister. Remember that ministers... Sorry. Mm. Ministers. The, the minister is responsible for the sector. Absolutely. Are you disputing that? He's the minister responsible for the sector. Yes. That is correct. But the point I'm making is that the minister's rule only um, comes to the fore at the level of policy directives. But it, it, it seems to me that the directive the minister issued it's more of an operational directive. Yes, it's asking them to carry arms. Give each of them arms on the ground. That appears to be an operational directive. I, I think that that power mm -hmm. rests solely in the hands of the Inspector General of Police. What is the basis of this claim? The basis of this claim is that the minister is supposed to give policy direction and not operational orders. You grant it in law for me. Which specific regulation? And or so, law are and you so, oh, oh no! If you look at the um, Interior Ministry, all ministries mm -hmm. are set up by law are supposed to give policy directives to the agencies that operate under them. No ministry, no ministry issues operational orders to agencies under them. Uh, this, this, this particular rule obtains more in the security sector. And so in the because case of the armed forces, yeah. the Minister for the Defense does not give operational orders to the men and women in uniform. The position is not any different with the, with the police service. And so the Minister for the Interior only gives policy directives. Uh, but, but, but if you uh, look carefully at the directive that the Minister for the Interior gave, Mm -hmm. It appears that he crossed the line a bit because to say that all MTD officers henceforth should be armed for me is more of an operational order or directive and for me that ought to have been left for the um, you know, men in uniform, especially the operational head of the police service, the inspector general of police to make. But having said that, let us assume that the minister even had the power to issue those directives. Was it necessary? I will say, Raymond, with, with the greatest of respect, that those directives, with the, with the greatest of, of respect, were not necessary at all. Because the police service, by law, are entitled to carry arms, firearms in the discharge of their duties. That is it. So the decision to arm men deployed to carry out operational duties for me should fall squarely on the doorsteps of the commander at any given time. Depending upon the uh, assessments made by the commander, the threat levels, etc., the commander may decide that the men who are about to be deployed to carry out a certain task be armed. Okay. If an assessment of the threat level is made because the police service, by law, is entitled to carry firearms in the discharge of their duties. So, for me, the minister's directive, in a way, was problematic. And that is probably why civil society organizations have mm -hmm. issues with it. Leave it. Let the professionals do an assessment of the threat levels at any given time. And, and if needs be... They may decide that we're going to arm the men to be deployed, to carry out or execute a certain task. So on a given day, if, say, the commander of the MTTD comes to the conclusion that, look, in deploying people mm -hmm. to perform motor traffic duties on the Accra Kumasi Highway, the threat level is going to be very high. On a given day, he may decide that I'm going to arm the men for that particular mission. I see. Now, 
is you are putting different perspectives in this particular case. Are you saying that the minister has no authority to give those directives? Or you're saying that it doesn't lie in the minister's mouth to be issuing such directives directly to the people on the ground? To the extent that the directive is in the nature of an, an operational, uh, uh, what do you call it, directive, I think there is everything problematic with that. Because the Police Service Act... Because you don't think they the need police arms. Service you, act, don't, you don't think they need arms? The Police Service Act yes. and the Constitution mm -hmm. clearly clothes the Inspector General of Police yeah. with the, the, the power to issue operational directives. Does the Inspector General of Police report to the Interior Minister? He reports in a way. He doesn't report or take directives from the Minister in the execution of his operational mandate as the uh, commander, overall commander of the police service, it is his singular responsibility to issue operational directives without taking orders from anybody. It's not semantics. Professionally. It's not, it's semantics. not, it's not semantics. No, because what policy it? is different from operations. Okay, so the general policy is that the Ghanaian people, through our Minister of State, have decided that all our traffic wardens are going to bear arms at all points but in time. But I'm saying That's that the policy. Uh, that is that 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 looks more like an operational order. Really? And I'm saying that that and that is why I think many people have issues. Okay, so let's put the guns aside. Now the minister also says we bought them bulletproofs. Every single one of them is going to be wearing their protective bulletproof gear. What's the problem with that? It is the ministry that budgeted for it. It is the ministry that defended this budget. Indeed, at appropriations, they had to go and fight for it. It's the ministry that got the money and will dispense this particular amount of money. You see, you see the duty of the ministry, mm -hmm. one is to ensure that budgeting is done for the agencies, including the police service. That's important. When the appropriation is done yeah. and procurement follows. Yeah. So we can okay, buy, so you give them we, we the equipment. We can buy them guns, but we tell, can't you, tell them what to do with how the guns. To, how, to, how to use the guns. So when the political leadership mm -hmm. of the police service descends into that arena, you have crossed a certain line. Extraordinary moments. You should bear You have that crossed that line. You should bear that moment. Give, this, these are give, extraordinary give moments. the equipment, mm -hmm. the, the, the tools, the working tools to the professionals. And, and let them make their own assessment. When they come to the conclusion that the threat level, mm -hmm. right, with respect to deployment, requires that arms be given to the men or bulletproof vests would be worn on that occasion, it becomes an operational issue. But, but yours is to provide them with those tools, the equipment. My only difficulty is that you are failing to acknowledge that this was an extraordinary moment. Listen, in a matter of days, five police officers, people who have sworn to protect Gadiers, lost their lives. And they were killed by people who were on the other side, some were criminals or whichever one, the people that they are supposed to protect. The minister identifies a major lacuna in the protection of these peace officers. And the minister insists that action be taken immediately. I don't and you are, you, you are interested. I don't in have whether or not the minister is staying out of policy Listen, or is Raymond, staying within remit of Raymond, this matter. Make no mistake. Yes. I am not saying that it is wrong to arm MTTD officers. So the principle is clear. It's clear. That they should be armed. Yes. And and and, and to even say they should be armed at, at all times. They should be armed. At all times. Uh, so that is where the problem comes in. What's the problem with that? The the decision to arm the officers at all times. Yes should depend upon a certain assessment made by the commanders. Absolutely. So, if on a given day, a commander, upon making an assessment of the threat levels, okay. comes to the conclusion that it is necessary to arm his men, that becomes the decision of the commander. So, but, but to say at all times, yes. The officers should carry arms, and that is a directive coming from the political leadership of a ministry. It's problematic. Is the political leadership not responsible for the lives that were lost in this case? 
they, they, they bear some responsibility. But is it all about arming the men? Let me give you an example. On uh, July 30th, mm -hmm. July 30th, 2019, mm -hmm. the late Agatha Nana Nabin yes. was armed. In Tamale. She was armed. That's true. But the assailants managed to gun her down. May her soul rest in peace. That's true. So it's, it's not just about carrying arms. The point is, do we have a holistic approach towards combating crime in our country? Is that is what should engage our attention. It but but, but it's, it's, it's very simple to say, because two people, two police officers died in the course of performing their duties, mm -hmm. The reason why they died was because they were not armed on that occasion. Were they armed on that That explanation occasion? may be legitimate. Were they armed? One can argue that if they were armed, yes. they probably would have been able to fight back. Yes. Yes. Good. And protect so, lives. So, so, so the fundamental question is, on that occasion, who deployed them? Did they make an assessment of the threat levels within that vicinity? I know, listen, yeah. I have examples of commanders who took it upon themselves, gave weapons, firearms, to mm -hmm. MTTD officers. Really? Yes. To perform duties on the highways. It, 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 it lies within the scope of their power to do so. There is no rule. Okay. The point I'm trying to make point. is I'm that I'm there is no rule which bars that. the MTTD from carrying firearms in the discharge of their duties. But some don't do that. Some don't do that. And so we probably should and begin to... to the extent that to some people have to actually display, and in this particular case, exhibit their discretionary right to either protect police officers or not, the minister says, I'm removing that discretion. Let the man bear his arm at all times. And you have a problem with that. I, I, to the extent that it is a ministerial directive which is clothed, in a manner that seems to suggest that it is a policy directive. I have issues with that. My point is that if a certain determination has been made that the threat mm -hmm. levels at the moment is very high, and so there is the need to arm all MTTD officers, that assessment is a professional one. And so, and so the directive and, and the should become... Make a professional exactly, assessment. absolutely. He can only come out with policy directives. Even when he might so have this, been this, informed. This, so point is, uh, tomorrow, if an assessment of the threat level indicates that it is not an issue at all, it's not a problem, the lives of officers will not be endangered if you deploy them, mm -hmm. can, can, can the commander stand down the orders, the directives the minister has given? If they cannot, it simply means that the minister has strayed into the area of uh, operations, which is wrong. That's the point. I'm Political making. leaders always control police officers. Political leaders in this state always control police officers. They have called on them to release people they have arrested before. They have called on them to act in ways that were contrary to how they wanted to operate in the first place. This clearly will not be the first time that a political leader said something that you believe should be the operational mandate of a commander, isn't it? Uh, well, well, Ribot, I don't know about so you. You need know to that, give you me the that. specifics. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You should Are give you me the specifics. That your entire time as deputy minister, there was no time in the ministry that any political leader had called a police officer to release somebody who had been arrested in this country. And I did that? I'm not saying you did. I'm yes. saying that you're saying that's not no time that incident ever happened. It's wrong, but uh, should we endorse wrongdoing? I'm asking wrongdoing? whether there was an incident like that during your time. No, should we ever? endorse wrongdoing? Can you state categorically? That there is no single incident. Remo, uh, I've, I've, I've heard about uh, those interferences. Oh, you, you heard, I've you heard. heard. But you never knew that they existed. I've heard. That but you have but no should, we countenance, should we countenance wrongdoing? I am it's saying wrong. That even when we had Nations criminals. are not built, I mean, that way. I get you. But that you countenance wrongdoing. I get you. But we, because we, those who, even who, when we who are engage caught criminals, in such conduct are, are politicians. Even when we are caught criminals, criminals that were supposed to be jailed, Intervention from higher political officers have led to them walking the streets of this there's country. There's everything wrong with that. I agree with you. Yes. Don't you think that if there's an interference that is leading to the protection of police officers, it's a better use of the powers of the minister? No, 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 no. Nobody's saying police officers should not be protected. Yeah. Police officers must be resourced. They, should, they must be given the necessary accoutrement to discharge their professional uh, mm -hmm. duties. Mm -hmm. 
and, and within in a safe atmosphere and you. environment. The lives of police officers matters. I, I get you. So except I don't have you, a problem at all. of the opinion uh, that uh, uh, if look, the protection is coming from the minister, there's a problem with no, it. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that the minister's directives will not in a way inure to the benefit of police officers. So it could inure to the benefit of police officers. The means in this it case. could, it could, but let this come from the professionals. When they make a professional assessment and there is the need to arm MTTD officers mm -hmm. on a given operation or upon an assessment of the threat level, if they think that for a week, for a year, MTTD officers are going to carry firearms in the discharge of their... The, let that come from the operational men. But to the extent that this, this directive is coming from a minister, question to ask is, tomorrow, if the threat level changes, can the operational men stand down the orders? That is why we have challenges. Contradicting the minister. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we need to draw the line. I don't have a problem at all if the MTTD officers, I get you. upon a clear assessment of the threat levels, mm -hmm. have to be armed. I and I've made a point that police officers are in law entitled to carry firearms in the discharge of their duties. So, so, so and that is why, arms. and that is why this whole issue couldn't have even. Uh, uh, been in the nature of a policy directive because that policy decision crystallized into law at the time the Police Service Act was enacted mm -hmm. by Parliament in 1960. Give That's the point I'm making. Give me a second. Like, I'll give you a further example. Yeah. You see, in 2016, John Mahama found the need mm -hmm. mm, upon several representations to reenact the Immigration Service Act. Yes. To pave the way for that service to bear firearms in the discharge of their mandate. And I heard that then. I minister, led the crusade. I, I led I, I led the, the charge in parliament. I heard the minister say that henceforth we shall have our immigration officers bearing arms. He didn't have a so, problem with so that. So he's reiterating a certain position that initially was in the form of a policy directive yes. which crystallized into law. In the case of the police service. This thing has been on the statute book since the 1960s. So, so, so if a minister comes out today... That this is the same thing. It's not necessary. If a minister comes out today and says, MTD sh should carry firearms, it presupposes that in law they are not supposed to carry firearms. And so he is now directing that they should bear firearms. Give me I'm a saying that, no, these guys have already been trained okay, I get to carry point. firearms. Yes. Where if as and when the commanders make the assessments and there yeah. is need for them to be giving firearms to carry out their mandate. So be it. Give me a second. We should be asking ourselves, Give have we retooled the police service enough? That's I'll just give I'm you an example. I've, I've, I've today, mm -hmm. I've gone around town quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I've seen the men. Are they bearing arms? They are not bearing arms. So what has become is, of the is directive? It, is, is it in clear violation? I thought the directive, the directive was supposed to take immediate effect. Yes. I've seen them around town. Today, the, haven't you seen some yes, of them, the Raymond? Yes, the police is defying from the interior minister. No. Me, that, that is why I, I thought the minister's directive was problematic. Let the professionals do their own assessment. And if they think that, say, the, the exigencies of a certain operation would require that the MTTD officers uh, be armed, so be it. It becomes a professional decision, okay. an operational okay. order. Mm. Okay? So if you may give a blanket order that they should all be armed immediately, and the commander sitting at Accra region mm -hmm. mm, comes to the conclusion that in, in, in deploying his men to perform MTTD duties yeah. around, say, the court vicinity, the court complex, yeah. the threat level is low and they wouldn't require firearms and he doesn't arm them. W w would that act be in defiance of the minister's order? Very well. I get your point. I don't think, I mean, clearly it will be, but what would be the point in it anyway? But let me get to listen. I told you about the very venerable words of Professor Harita Bensa Bonsu. She's an expert in this area by all standards and qualifications. Indeed, her last major operation that you know in this country is that she sat on the Ayahuasca West Wagon Commission and made very profound statements about Ghanaian security and how it's going about. This is what she said to the directive from the Interior Minister. I believe that there is a paradigm shift in peace and security 
which has to be recognized by the average person. It has moved from the governmental level to the individual level. And now the individual is the bulwark of peace, really. So there's a call for more education. Security matters no longer are secret because if the individual don't know what to look out for and what to resist, we will have problems. Clearly, it's time for us to take a firm look at gun control. It is time for us to take a firm look at our police because there are serious policing issues involved. I don't believe arming every police officer is the answer. I do not believe that. It will only endanger the public some more. We can do better with what they have or the special teams that they have can be deployed to more effect. But to give each and every police officer a gun, I don't think is there. The point has been made. Do you defy an opinion from this expert opinion? No. I, uh, but that is the point I have been trying to make all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, so uh, listen, is it about merely dishing out arms that can deter and prevent crime? In a way, yes. But even, even in situations where police officers, I mean, were armed to their teeth, criminals managed to gun them down. I just gave you the example of the late Agatha yes. Nabin in the Tamale. One that in Tamale yeah. Absolutely. I mean, elsewhere, I mean, in the US, police officers who are usually armed to the teeth with all the bulletproof vests, et cetera. I, I mean, the, the, the mortality rate amongst officers in line of duty is staggering. Yeah. I mean, even in the U.S. So you, but the, the, that's why I said that, look, we need to adapt a holistic approach to the fight against crime. What, 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 what happened to the police officers is a clear reflection of the general security situation in our country. It mirrors the overall security situation in our country. Absolutely. Within, 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 within the period of, what, 30 days, we're talking about five deaths? Isolated, less likely to be repeated situations, really. But that is serious. It mirrors the but general security situation in our country. As in for just the 30 days or for the entire period of the year, the previous year or the last the two previous years? Previous year, the last two years, I mean, the crime statistics, if it's anything to go by, we've, we've made the point, time would add number the that robbery was, incidents, robbery well, incidents well on are decline. on the ascendancy. Really? How? Decline? Yes. But 2016, 2017, you are talking about 27% 20, increase. 2018, the situation even got worse. In the first quarter alone, we recorded close to a thousand cases of robbery. And you're saying that incidents of the robbery police had a declined? Press the police had a press conference and specifically stated that contrary to the opinion and the position the minority in Ghana's parliament would want the people of this republic to believe, the robbery situation and general crime statistics are on the decline. How? How is that possible, Raymond? But I, I, I How mean, is that possible? I've, I, I've, I just told I, you that day, but the statistics I, I have alluded that to, the, the statistics, stat you are statistics I have alluded what to, what is the source of these statistics? From the Statistics and Information Technology Unit of the CID. The same police the service. The same police service. The same police service had a press conference and said crimes are on the decline. So, I that the same units gave you information. And somebody, I mean, pulling strings from behind the scenes. No, I don't think anybody is. To whitewash. Why, why do you suspect to that? To whitewash what is otherwise a very bad situation. Is that a very bad situation? It's a very bad situation. The security situation in our country is bad. Government Com must sit to up. what? Oh, compared to um, the, 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 the situation in the previous administration, President Mahama. And you see were promised clearly yes a better security environment this became an issue for which 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 engaged the at attention of npp policy makers and so in their manifesto it was captured let's break peace this and down. security let's break this down so so when we speak in comparative terms yes. we are constrained to do so because these issues engaged the attention of the then opposition, which is now in power. Let's break this And so down. if things are not getting any better, we have every right to speak in comparative terms, and that is what I'm engaging Let's in. Let's break this down. When John Dramani Mahama was president of this republic, 
how many bulletproof vests and uh, gear was bought for the police in this country? I, I, if, 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 if you wanted to ask me this very it's pointed a, it's question, an important one. we bought quite a number of them. I can't mention numbers. Specifics. I can't give you specifics, Raymond. Were they the up number to 4,000? Number of bulletproof vests. Were they up Within to 4, the period 000? that we were in office, we definitely must have bought more than that. Really? Remember that the, the police, police service said that this is the highest they have ever received they, uh, uh, in any period since it was established. Are they are they talking in comparative terms? They said in any period, in any since period it was established. Uh, no, you see, sometimes we must not be carried away by by the propaganda. I've heard the deputy by, by minister for the information by, by says so. I've not heard this from the police service directly. I heard the minister for the inf information, deputy minister, put out this information. Pious. Yes, pious. We need to be careful here. The police but, but service you has always had data to contradict it. The police service, all that you have the is police Russell service. Botsam. No, no, no. If you wanted specifics, Raymond. No, would, no, no. But uh, I mean, in all fairness, request for some, in all fairness, yes. you should have asked me to furnish you with figures, and I'd be able to I do that. I didn't ask you to bring the. And I can remember some of the sorry, things. Sorry. I, I didn't ask you to bring the manifesto I, I, portions no, of no, the no, NPP. No, no, here. no, no. Yet you brought it. No, no, because no. Because you talked about your bulletproof and make your case. So yes, you want better. us? You want us to begin to talk about things we did for the police? Service. Because it's important. You want us to begin to talk we about things about we did for the police? We whether or not we position the police I, I, to yeah, be protected. Yeah, we did. We did what we could in the face of what uh, 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 the scarcity. We did what we could. The police During service the itself, the police service itself, mm -hmm. the officers and men in uniform would admit that under the watch of the NDC, their welfare improved. Remember that like they, were, they, got more they, were, they, they were the first uh, to benefit from, from the single spine salary oh, scheme. Yes, I, they were. I, I they remember. were. Yes. They were. They were. Well, if you're talking about vehicles, yeah, I, I heard, the economic I've heard government, has I've heard gov the fizzle out immediately. I've, I've heard government communicators talk about the procurement of 600 uh, vehicles. Listen, between 2010 mm -hmm. and 2014, we delivered 1,500 vehicles to the police service alone. We did. 2010, yes. between 2010 uh -huh. and 2014. Yes, four years. Yes, we delivered 1,500 vehicles to the police service. Four years. Thousand what? 500 in four years. No, I'm saying that, yes, to the police service alone. To the police service alone. Aye, you delivered we, less than we, vehicles We established, per year. listen, mm -hmm. we established the police marine unit. Before then, the police couldn't patrol our territorial waters. Big deal. We bought speedboats for them. It's the business of the. That was part of the retooling process. It was part of. Territorial waters. Absolutely. You don't police know. Police territorial our, waters. You don't know. Our territory yes. includes our Not territorial the waters. No. The police. No. Is so what's, what's the Navy's use in this case? Yes, so whenever the Navy is called upon to patrol yes. the territorial waters, yes. you are talking about internal security. The territorial waters forms part of Ghana's territory. Yes. The military's core mandate mm -hmm. is to ward off external aggression against our territory. But <laughs> if the I operations see. are internal in nature, I see. so whenever the Navy mm. has patrolled our territorial waters and effected arrests, mm -hmm. They do that with the involvement of the police. Even if they do without the involvement of the police, upon effecting the arrest successfully, they hand over to the police. So the achievement of the NDC is that you formed a unit yes. within the, the police. The Marine Police Unit. All that you did was ask policemen to now be categorized into a new unit. The and Marine this, Police Unit. Yes, it's, that's what it's, you did. It's you a just, major unit you, within you, the police service. The, the police they existed. were trained. The members resisted, right? Absolutely. The police officers. No, no, no. You just no, gave them a new no, name to a title. No, no, no. We established it from scratch. By what you bought them vessels? Speed boats. We established it. I see. We established it. Make no mistake. And that's most it. of the operational units you find in the police service unit, the FPU, the formed police unit, mm -hmm. the counter-terrorism unit, we established them. So make no mistake. Let nobody. Yeah, I think the police would have let, preferred let, more let, cars. Yeah, to yeah absolutely. So units. we didn't do all. We admit that yes, the police needs to be retooled more and more and more. You admit that so this that government has done more than the previous government. Uh, 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 in the last two what and a half done, years. What they've done comes nowhere near what the NDC administration did for the police service. And yes, you can't remember the, the number of approved vests you bought The officers and men in uniform will testify mm -hmm. to this. Really? This is a government that threatened to withdraw Cap 30 for the police, remember? And yeah, I locked horns with them. Remember this current yes, government? Yes. And for, I locked horns with better, them. So, uh, they they don't have any system. regard for the welfare of the officers and men. better pension system. Look, in 2012... We passed CI-76, 
that is the police service regulations. In it, in and the CI seventy six. Does it prevent more police? No, 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 no. And the CI for we 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 clearly promulgated a certain regime for compensation for mm. police officers who die in line die in line of duty. It's very clear to me, given where I am sitting now, that okay. this government is not even aware about the content of CI seventy six. Because Why? when 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 the late Emmanuel uh, Chief Inspector Emmanuel Ashilevi died. Yes, I heard I heard some statements attributed to the vice president when they went there to uh, 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 console the bereaved uh, family. They spoke as though there is no clear-cut uniform compensation package for officers who die in line of duty. I is want to refer them to the, 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 the CI 76, which was passed in 2012, under our watch, what, once again. What does it say? Once again, oh, you want me to, to, to make reference to it? I will, Raymond. No, I just want to know specifically what, what it says. I mean, merely having the yes, law is nothing Yes, yes, compensation, 126, section 126. An officer who sustains injuries, and it goes on and on. Let me read this. Uh, 126 2. An officer who dies in the execution of lawful duty without fault on that officer's part is entitled to compensation calculated as the product of the consolidated annual salary of the deceased officer multiplied by 60 months and divided by 12 months. Yes. So if he sustains injury, it's you stated. Some, yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the way and manner they spoke when the late Inspector Shilevi fell and may his soul rest in peace suggests that they are not even aware about these provisions which touches on the welfare of the men and women in uniform. So my advice to them is to take a close look at CI 76 and implement it to the letter and stop creating the impression that there is no legal framework for such compensation. Who Today you go and stand no there. Legal and that is the suggestion government made. When who, who in government? Chief the vice president, he when Chief Inspector Ashilevi died, yes. you can Google it. They created the impression that they were going to put in place a mechanism to ensure that there was uniform compensation for officers who fall in line of when duty. When did he say this? When Inspector Ashilevi died. Yes, that this period, is very recent. It's a very long period. It's very recent. Sorry. You remember the atomic Which police station day attack? Did he make the statement? You want me to Google it? I can no, no, Google no, no, it and uh, give you the you specifics. But you are making claims that the vice president has said something. Uh, yes, I'm asking yes. you for specifics. I, I, I can give you the specifics, Raymond, if 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 you'd give me. Is uh, it in, in your notes? Yes, is yes what it saying? is in my notes. I can give you, uh, uh, um, you know, just because I need to be able to tell, ask them specifically yes, yes, with dates. Yes. That's what I'm asking yes. you. Yes. So so you see, um, this thing happened. You can't find the date. I can't, no, no, I can't find the date. But if you like, I could give you the date. Doesn't I have the details how much compensation package was announced. 185,000. Can we start from the was announced. When if you want happen? the date, I'm saying that I could Google it. I, go, I could immediately Google this, but for want of time. Honorable. Yes, I'll Google this for you. Made a statement. Yes. I'm just I, But you, you would recall that he attended... Inspector Ashilevi's funeral. Yes. It was at the funeral that this announcement was made. And he said, he spoke on behalf of the president, that the president had instructed, mm -hmm. had directed, that some mechanisms be put in place for the uniformed what, payment of compensation to officers, as if to suggest that there was no legal framework in place. So this interpretation is yours. They it's not mine. It's he said this at the funeral of Inspector did, did Emmanuel Ashilevi. He categorically that there was no legal framework in place. But, but if, if, if he knew about the existence of the legal framework, why was he saying that the president had instructed that mechanisms, what mechanisms? The mechanism is the CI-76 so, that we passed so, in 2012. So my point is that mm -hmm. It appears to me that they are oblivious of the, the content and that the provisions all, all, all of the, CI 76. All these falling police officers can should be properly compensated under CI 76. The, the amount, I just read the provisions the to you. The amount specifically devoted to the late Ashilevi's family was it below what the compensations in CI 76 dictated? Is that your allegation? It appears to me yes. that the criteria for computation was mm -hmm. not done in accordance with CI 76. Because if they had done that, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be talking about uniformity. Because the CI 76 covers all police officers. I see. Absolutely. 
What now? We're talking about the things that you think this government can do. In fact, this government has always heard that it has a better record when it comes to tooling the police than your government. I've just faulted that. Yes, you have suggested that that logic me. is warped. What statistics are they looking at? I just gave you the example that if it is they about vehicles, for example, bullet, if it is about vehicles, vest. I just told you that between 2010 and 2014, yes. how many years is that? Three years? That is. The four police years. took the, lav the delivery of 1,500 vehicles. Yeah, they are talking year, about 600, year, 600 vehicles 600. in three years. Oh, is it not one year? Are we not in the third year? Yes, we are in the of third an MPP year, yes, administration. Yes. So what are we talking about? Okay, now let me get this also clarified. So you talk about units that you put together. You also made reference to, but all of these are means to an end. Was the police more protected during your tenure than now? They were more protected. This is when you talk about protection. Yes. Uh, then it, it's multidimensional. Protection in terms of what? The assurance that when you fall in line of duty, your dependence would be catered for. That yes. is why. That is why. I'm, I'm sure they really don't. Wait, wait a minute. The wait a minute. Wait they a minute. Would, would but that is why. Yeah, that, no, no, them no, from no, 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 no. Make no mistake. Yes. So protection, like I said. I get you. Yeah. There so, are several dimensions so, to it. So yes. But, so, but not so, all police so, officers so the are waiting to die for their parents, make, for their no, family make, to no, get something. Once you, once you, you agree yes. to be recruited mm -hmm. or commissioned into the, the officer corps of the police administration, you make a certain undertaking that if the need arises, you would place your life okay. you, uh, you, you know, on the altar of death mm -hmm. for the defense and protection of your country. That is what it means to be uniformed. Okay. That is what it means. I get you. So if you make that undertaking, I'm saying that there is need for certain guarantees to be put in place to assure the men and women in uniform that look, in the event that you fall in line of duty, your dependents are going to be catered for by the state. And then in recognition of uh, 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 this, if you like, duty on the part of the state which is owed to the officers and men in uniform, we passed CI 76 in 2012. 2012. But I'm saying that having passed CI 76, it appears that those regulations are not being implemented. And that is why I, I, am, I, am, I, am, I am extending so an I invitation to the government made. to apprise itself Give of the content of CI 76 in, in minutes, and deal with falling, 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 our fallen heroes in the police what service. What else can the government of this republic do today beyond having to give guns to the police to protect police officers? So training is crucial. We need to... Training. Training okay. is crucial. Mm -hmm. And... When I say training, that should involve really, encompass this retraining or something. Absolutely, yes. It as should as encompass uh, intelligence gathering. I see. I'm happy the police has, in recent times, uh, set up an intelligence uh, gathering unit department, okay, to beef up intelligence gathering. Okay. Policing and intelligence gathering go hand in hand. Okay. They didn't have that in the past. Now they have it. It's 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 a good uh, uh, starting uh -huh. for them. So when you do that, I think that it's key. If we had intelligence on the ground, I'm sure we probably would have picked up intelligence on the movement of those criminals who, who unfortunately uh, uh, cut short the lives of the two police, two officers, police officers in Kasua. Yeah. The okay. fact that they were even armed on that occasion, we would have picked up intelligence. But they were arrested later on. Actually. They were arrested later on, yes, that is commendable. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that uh, uh, retraining Mm -hmm. Which definitely should also include uh, training the men and women in uh, the, the, the tactics to okay. be proactive in gathering intelligence. For me, it's very crucial. So we need to invest in uh, uh, that aspect as well. Uh, aside the uh, uh, retooling okay. that has become an issue. Uh, now, now, let me just ask you one question, Ramon. They claim well, they retool the service better than us. But we have a, big, a better record in terms of crime management. And so statistics were down. In 2014 alone, I can give you an example. Major crime incidents reduced by 15% because of the interventions we had made at the time. The men were well motivated. Single which, spine which had taken effect. About? 2014. Okay. 2014. Mm -hmm. Yes. Major crime rates and their incidents reduced by 15% because we had undertaken certain interventions like the introduction of the visibility and accessibility concept in policing community policing, 
And so you, the police became more visible and deterred crime in the process. We did all these things. We started the new units you can boast of today, counter-terrorism unit, the formed police unit. Yeah, formed police the... unit now makes it possible for our police service to deploy formed units, formed elements in but international peace operations. I, I get you. This and in a way, that is also, uh, 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 it's got to do with welfare, right? These points you have made and you have raised previously. The other question I have for you on this particular end is um, the management of the Takwa the girls issue. Up till now, we're still going through having to do DNA and all the other things. The family is still not convinced that this government is committed or the security services are committed to getting to the bottom of this matter. How else should we do with this problem? Well, this, this, this uh, problem uh, largely, once again, is a reflection of the general security situation in our country, which is nothing to write home about. I had occasion to uh, subject the Minister for the Interior to questioning in, 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 in Parliament. And, and, and as usual, on that occasion, there were attempts to equalize. Yeah, but, but, but for me... Because to be fair, between 2014 and 2018, that year of 2014 had the highest number of kidnappings. So you really but, have but, no but, 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 but you see authority the, to be claiming The circumstances superior. exactly may not be the same. I get your When point. the minister was questioned mm -hmm. whether he knew whether or not those incidents of kidnapping were resolved, he couldn't. Okay. He couldn't. I see. He said he was not in office. Mm -hmm. But under their watch, he was able to tell us how many of those incidents of kidnapping they had resolved. Okay. Say for the uh, 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 kidnapping of the three Takradi girls. I see. And given the conduct, the overall conduct of um, the police service, the CID boss, you know, we're wondering whether any responsible government at all wouldn't have relieved the CID boss of a position long ago really? in order to inspire confidence really? in the good people of Ghana. Yes, yes, yes. I've had occasion Be to make that point. And I will read through it. I, with the rest of this. Actually, shared this. intelligence? Yes. What was the nature of the intelligence? And she shared it the rest of us. What was the nature of the intelligence? And you don't think that she was who, just who did the, Who did the intelligence assessment? Remember that. Okay. They were not duty bound mm -hmm. to put out information that they knew the whereabouts of the girls and that they were going to be rescued in no time and to reunite with their parents. They were not duty bound to you. do that. They could, they could merely have given assurance that we are working assiduously towards uh, rescuing the girls. Full stop. I, I'm but they, up. they went a step further okay. by, I get you. by saying to the hearing of the whole world mm -hmm. that they knew where the girls were. I'm wrapping up with this conversation. And so if all of a sudden you come out there and say you have uncovered uh, dead bodies in, 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 in what? A pit. And that there is a likelihood that those are the bodies of the, the, the girls. They didn't say so. But I'm wrapping up on this conversation. The last comment I want from you is the attacks in South Africa of other nationals in that particular state. What should be State Ghana's reaction? Are we on the right track? Is government's response appropriate? Well, I, I, it's, uh, what the, 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 the happenings in South Africa is very unfortunate. I think this is about the third time yeah. xenophobic uh, reactions and attacks have erupted in, mm -hmm. in, in, in that country. For me, I, I think that we need a concerted uh, uh, approach. What does that mean? To deal with this at the level of the African Union. Okay. Countries um, cannot deal with uh, this issue all by themselves when we have the continental body in place. I've heard my colleague Okujetu suggest, he's the ranking member for foreign affairs, yes. that maybe South Africa should be sanctioned mm -hmm. and that the uh, African parliament, which is hosted by South Africa, the Pan-African parliament, be taken should be taken away. I, I, I think I agree largely with my colleague mm. uh, because what is happening there, seriously speaking, undermines continental unity it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem to me that south africa is the country that suffered uh, appetite and mm -hmm. the whole of the african continent stood firmly by them we supported them in terms of resources in fact some people even volunteered and went in there to fight on behalf of the anc africans Forgive me, but I need to go. Thank you so much. My guest today has been the Honorable former Deputy Minister of Interior, the Honorable James Agaga. 
He's still a member of parliament. He will be contesting to, I'm sure, on the ticket of the NDC, which he just got renewed for him. Folks, thank you so much for joining us on today's edition of Our Front. Hope to see you another day.